Hey, everybody. How are you? Um, okay, so Linda did a boo-boo. Um, I realized that um, fall back, spring forward, that happened. And so I put 5 p.m. our time. But welcome to Into the Core podcast with myself, Linda. I'm your host. And today I have an amazing person who we're going to be talking to. And um, I don't even want to put in yet the word because you already know who I'm going to be talking to. But I must put in my intro before I even introduce him. So here we go. Into the Core. And we're waiting for it. Apparently. Into the core. Get into it. All good things in Africa and beyond. Into the core. Into the Yeah, we say all good things that are happening in Africa and beyond. And for sure, we are doing things from Africa beyond and making things and good things happen. So let me do my introduction. So he's definitely an award-winning chef, celebrated globally. Um, you know, we're taking this one uh, a a as an African night. He's a best-selling author, a TV star, and at the time we need it the most, we have a celebrity who is bringing in a book called The Rise, Black Cooks and the Soul of America. Now, before we even get into the book, this is my one thing about you. When I'm at my mother's place with my son, what I normally watch is the Food Network, and I always think Maya Marcus, Maya Marcus. And because your beautiful wife, um, uh, I, I will really want to say that she she really supported the Hub of Africa Fashion Week, which started in Ethiopia. She was there for us. And so I remember when I started this podcast, I was like, can I get the both of you? And she was like, I need to celebrate my husband. He's doing something. So you need to wait, wait for me, but celebrate my husband first. And oh my gosh, what a pleasure. Um, so welcome to, Thank you. to the core podcast, Marcus Samuelson. Wonderful. Uh, is out of Nairobi or where are you doing? Out of Nairobi, out of nice. Nairobi. <laughs> little little, little, uh, little uh, Africa Silicon Valley there. I know, I know. All the tech masters in Nairobi. I know about you guys. Exactly. That's great. That's great. Awesome. How yeah, are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. It, uh, uh, you know, it's very hectic coming off um, the election, and we're still in it, of course. Of you know, course. both Maya and I was out there uh, getting out people to vote, and you know, Harlem is so special. Uh, the Harlem booths, voting centers are different. You know, there are DJs outside. We were out there handing out food with World Central Kitchen, and you really see in times like this, it's important to. Think about the positives. You see the best in people. People who are out there, elderly people who are out there, um, you know, uh, and and young and all ethnicities and cultures. So, um, you know, I'm I'm proud of my community. Um, Uptown did it right. You know, one thing that I really loved about you is um, your involvement throughout the whole process. And I don't want to start with right now in 2020. But you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I was reading about it about two thousand and nine. Your, you know, you're hosting one of your first, um, you know, uh, as a guest chef um, for Obama's administration. Yeah. Twenty ten, you're hosting a fundraiser at the Red Rooster, and then coming in, you know, um, what are your thoughts about the whole political situation right now, and what does that mean for America? Well, I think that. First of all, you have to, as a black person, somebody that's always connected to the continent where I'm from, you have to first acknowledge your privileges, right? That's number, start with that. You know, my wife is healthy, my son is healthy, Diane is healthy, mm. and obviously the pandemic has turned not just America, but the world upside down. 
yeah. right? So you have to, every day when you wake up, you have to acknowledge your, your privileges and then go from there. Uh, because yeah. tomorrow is not um, promised to you. And, uh, you know, I think that someone with my background being adopted, being saved out of a hospital, uh, you live close to that. When that has happened to you, you kind of start the, the book on the second chapter. So yeah. you, there's a level of gratitude that I just navigate my world through. And it's that level of navigation that also been an immigrant many, many times to, you know, many countries. In, you know, I grew up in Sweden, but I also was an immigrant into Switzerland and France and so on. So, you know, you learn how to navigate through Gra gra gratitude, you know, and mm. but yet be sharp enough when it matters. So there's, there's a level of, you know, in South Africa and, and it's used to all over Africa, but we think about the word Ubuntu, right? And that word, you know, people work to have great Ubuntu, you know, it's really absolute. And, and I think that as, a, as being in this moment, in these times, you think about that. So for me, it meant to constantly how do i give back and how do i share so me and my friend jason diakate we started a podcast just like you it's called this moment where we talking about of course the election right now but it's also transatlantic by connecting black creatives from africa from europe with america right so this whole strategy of of um uh racism is also a lot of distraction so it's very important as creatives that you kind of have to figure out what's noise, what's real, and how do you keep your core, both from a mental level, but also from a creative level, uh, yeah. so you can actually put out the work and the worth that you've done. Absolutely, and, and, and the truth is we all have, um, right now I feel like is a very, it's the moment where we all start realizing who we are you know, um, essentially, I mean, like for me, the, the podcast started when um, I, you know, we went into this whole pandemic and I've had a little bit of a background in radio and I was like, I love talking to people. I want to find out how I can encourage people. What can I say about what people are doing? Because my friends are not just in Africa, but they are beyond you know, mm -hmm. so how are we going to create that conversation? And for me, um, celebrating um, the people who are out there and having gratitude for who we are. Like you said, we're healthy, we're okay, we're, we're, we're doing fine, we're forging mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important. So um, let me backtrack just a little bit, um, especially into your culinary world. Um, and I'm gonna, this comes back and pieces back into monumental election right now. Um, you know, you got adopted, obviously, when you were young um, in Sweden. And one of the people who actually um, inspired you was your grandmother. Yeah. And what what was that like? I mean, like, you know, was this her bringing you into the kitchen and saying, hey, get in here with me, let's learn this? Or was this just you paying absolute interest in what she is doing and, and you jumping into it, which brings you into creating... Um, your storyline and your storyline is also for me through your books. And, you know, I've been looking at your books and I'm like, oh my gosh, what mm. an amazing, you know, it's like a, it's like a symphony <laughs> in my, in my life. You know, um, my grandmother, I mean, it's re it just really comes down to a couple of things what we need, right? Love that, that Absolutely. love that only a grandmother can give. It's, it's, it's of the same place as a mother and family, but it's just yet a little different because it's been lived yeah. in a little bit longer and, um, you know, it is very special, that connectivity that her grandmother loved. And she was loving on us, you know, she was, and she was sharing. My grandmother was not well-educated. She wasn't well-traveled. She, you know, mm -hmm. she come from the time when even Sweden was very, very poor. But what she was rich on was knowledge of cooking and navigation in life. And I have yeah. to tell you, Lindy, that, that, like, during this time of the pandemic, I thought about my grandmother more than ever. She grew wow. up in a time when there was Ransom's book where you were not allowed to get more potatoes and flowers and X, Y, and Z. Well, guess mm. what? When I stood in the lines to get into the stores and we have to make quick decisions we could buy, you know, it reminded me of, you know, no matter what, I can get into that store and I can cook for my family so I could be, you know, faster navigating through that store. So 
you know, this is things that hardship is something that when you come from the continent of Africa, we always connected to it. But in this right. way, it hasn't happened to America, especially hasn't happened to middle class and above. So it was, I felt that my grandmother and just being African gave me tools, Kamaya tools, that we can actually know how to navigate. Because no matter who you are in Africa, you are close to your cousins on the countryside. You understand the journey of how someone wakes up early in the morning to get water. You understand you're very close and connected to a journey of struggle, but yeah. also a journey of happiness and a journey of uh, family. So my grandmother's love was just about what she knew, which was cooking. And she would sort of give me and my sisters all of that. And as a little kid, I responded to it probably more than my sisters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but my sisters are amazing cooks, but they're just home cooks and, and you know, went in a different profession. For me, you know, I also had so much energy as a kid and still has. So cooking was something that sports and cooking was the two things that really tired me. So I think my parents really liked that as well. Um, and then, you know, when I was a teenager, I got scholarships and started to see the world very differently, right? Um, how come there's no black people in these French kitchens? What's my role? How do I fit yeah. in? How do I create? When I started to look for cookbooks, there was no cookbook that reflected our journeys. Okay, so you can go two ways in life. Those are really opportunities or this wears you down so much so you don't um, have the courage and guts to go for it. For me, I took notes. There was no women in the kitchen. There was no people of color. And for me, I was like, all right, so when I get the chance to become a chef, I'm going to hire women and I'm going to hire people of color and I'm going to tell yeah. my stories. You know, I, I really admire that because, you know, um, I think something as monumental as being invited as a guest chef in 2009, you know, Obama administration, um, getting your restaurant anyway, having moved into Harlem and started um, this whole journey. I have a question. Was that excitement? Was that um, a little bit of pang? Or was that like, you know what? I've got something to prove. I'm going to show you how great we are. I, you know, I think for me, it's, it's, it's you got to pay your dues and taxes in a way, right? Like <laughs> yeah. up, especially as a, as a black kid in Sweden, you look and searching for your identity and your heroes are very often either on the continent, whether Fela Kuti or Nelson Mandela or Haile Selassie, or, but often they're very often from America, from specifically from African-American culture. Mm. And when you look at that, so much of Mecca for is of black culture is in Harlem, whether it's James Baldwin or whether it was the Apollo where, you know, the Jackson uh, performed, James Brown performed. So, you know, there, it becomes this epicenter of culture. So when I lived in Manhattan, which Harlem is obviously part of Manhattan, but when you live downtown, I was lucky, I was fortunate, I made money, but I had no community. And it wasn't my neighbor's fault, right? I yeah. lived anonymously, I didn't check into my neighbor. I didn't, you know, so I lived in this doorman building. It was convenient for one thing, to go to work. And I said to myself, you know what? If I'm gonna start something, it has to be more than just cooking for the 1% of the 1%. And that again, go back to being privileged. If you have the privilege of getting, now you got a job, now you got the job that you like, now you, you your finances works. Okay, what's the next step in life? So eventually right. you start thinking about how can I add value to something that is larger than yourself? And that's what the journey of Red Rooster was. There was seven years between opening the restaurant and moving to Harlem because mm. I didn't have the right information and knowledge. I had to study that. And just like taking a PhD, it takes about seven years. So I had to study that, right? And I had to study and walk in Harlem and learn from aunties and uncles and photographers because as we do in Africa, Harlem also Close. operates different, do you know? Yeah. Like you have yeah. to sit. The best food is not in restaurants. You know that. The best food right. might be on the Saturday in the park with the Jamaicans grilling. Or your best cornbread might be after an after church program with, with you know, Miss, Miss Mabel. You know what I mean? You have to be where the food is at, not just this institutional way, the way downtown works, right? 
So it was really about understanding. And again, it goes back to my African side that I, I, I knew that just because these ladies were not written about, it didn't mean exist, didn't mean we're in group, because our black narratives have always been told uh, in a, they were not so rarely told from us and by us. So you had to learn how to navigate our history and that helped me. So opening the restaurant was big and, and then it was also an opportunity to do something that is in Harlem and of Harlem, right? Finding that balance between in and of, inspiration and aspirations. Let's talk about um, a little bit about the inclusion, you know, when it comes to um, the book that you're doing right now, that the book that you've done um, to me and the reviews that you have is that um, it definitely is a movement. It's a celebration of, um, you know, as, as you say, you had to study Harlem, you had to study what was going on and that becomes um, a journey. I, I'm talking about all the books that you have written mm. that leads up to 2020, The Rise um, and uh, Black Cooks, The Soul of America and um, Inclusion. I mean, like, um, I have to read this because it says, um, Vogue says that The Rise places you at the center of conversation, which I absolutely agree with. You know, um, it's about walking away from the bias of black and um, learning that there's a lot of things that influence us. Um, there's a lot of takes that happen and a lot of black community never gets, um, what is it? We never get uh, appreciated for, Is it, if that is one thing just to say very mildly. Um, but also, I mean, like what you are doing is that you're, you're celebrating influence, creativity, tradition. Um, talk to me a little bit about the influences that came mm -hmm. with your book and, and homage to um, those that have contributed to it. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't talk about American food without talking about African blackness, right? Whether, yeah. it, you know, so it's first about acknowledging that just like you can't talk about rhythm blues without Mali and West Africa, or talking about, uh, there's so many linkages, right? So if you think about, so we as Africans, we as black people have to figure out our own worth, first of all. And in certain verticals, the, the oral history is kept and the written history is kept, so it's easier to dive in. Let's say in music, you can dive in because it's recorded, that's what record, the beauty of records is, you can go back. Yeah. The beauty of writing is that it's recorded, so now it exists. Mm -hmm. So so much of our genius works orally, which is beautiful, but it also makes it hard to claim it. So if you're going to buy your mom a beautiful box of chocolate, you might say, oh, I'm going to get you Belgian chocolate. There's, yeah. there's no cocoa beans in Brussels. If you're going to say, hey, I have my friend from England coming, and I want to buy her some great Kenyan coffee. And someone's gonna say, oh, you mean the French roasted or the Italian espressos? There's no espresso mm -hmm. beans in Italy. So every, so what does that do? It creates a, it's as, it's as absurd as if I would tell you, this great car that I have is called Mercedes. It's from Nairobi. Everyone in the world would say, hey, it's not from Nairobi, it's from Germany. So our worth you can take, reshape, remold, but when you take something out of the, if I would say to you, if Facebook was created in Cape Town, people would recommend right race. They're like, absolutely, right? This is not true. Yeah. So, we, but with our beauties and our raw materials, there's no checks and balances, which then first creates confusion for everybody. Because if you're gonna say to your kid, hey, go into cooking, he has no value proposition of what's good or what's not. Right? Yeah. And that's what yeah. we've done. So it was important to acknowledge, hey, let's let's reclaim, let's create a level of record of the authorship so all of us understand where it came from. Then the second part was what are the influences? Well, without American, if you think about Creole cooking in New Orleans, that's at least 50, 60 percent influences of Africa. Then you think about barbecue, all those rich stems from Africa. 
They yeah. think about soul food, southern food, that's at least seven or eight percent from African design, right? So now you're talking about three distinct scene in America out of a very young country. We don't have the same rituals as we would have in Africa in America because obviously it's a much more harsh part of, of, of country. So, so this, is, this is a very, very, very different um, starting point. But now when restaurants is a big, uh, and blackness is not one thing, right? Which we African understand. You specifically in Kenya, I'm from Ethiopia. We're both black. We share a lot, but we have different journeys. You eat Ugali, I eat injera, right? Right there, it's it's just very um, well, you know. So you have much more influence of, let's say, Indian food on the coastal side, right? You have to geographically understand that to know what the food is, right? Most people don't. So it's also important that blackness doesn't just live in one space in America. It also lives through immigration and migration. So a Haitian American and a Jamaican American and Ghanaian American, all are black, but we have different starting points when it comes to food. Yeah. Um, tell me how, you know, what what was the realization that you needed to to put this book together? I mean, like I, I can, now I see the background of it, but like, what was the moment where you're just like, look, I need to pay attention to why and, and, and how I really want to go about this and the people that I want to reach out to who could influence some of the recipes that are coming well, out of this. I think, it's a combina- I think it's a combination. You have to realize, you know, I'm in a very privileged position. Absolutely. I, I can walk into a publishing company anywhere and I know I'm going to get my book published. So that's a responsibility and a privilege, which means that you can't put up garbage. You have a responsibility. I can't waste your time. Like that's for me, it's always I think about the author. Like, and mm-hmm. I think about the readers. Like sometimes you are the author and sometimes you are the reader. I'm like the reader is going to sit down with her family or book with his family. So I better add value, right? Then the other part is as a chef, I mentored a lot of people. A lot of people have mentored me. What is my give back plan? So. This is the second book about the continent. I did Soul of a New Cuisine 15 years ago, which was kind of the door yeah. opener to that. So for me, it's all, always about what is the legacy you want to create, right? And then you want to amplify. And amplify, you can do many ways. You know, with my podcast, we amplify. We talk about the book on and off, but we talk about Africa. So we amplify these stories. In this day and age, the book is the trampoline, right? It's the jump off point. Then you gotta then you gotta create channels and doors around that so people so you get the word out, right? Especially we're up against you know, when we do today's show with Morning America, I'm up against the election. You know what I mean? It's very hard to get airtime. So for me, creating this moment, the podcast was very, very important. Talking and having speakers on from Africa, of Africa. So there's a bridge there about blackness and quality and and, and ingenious. So it's not just a book, the book represents food and the people of food, but it's also about having a large conversation about thickness in Africa and the value proposition of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do feel that the conversation still runs deeper and um, there's definitely a lot of people who have not been you know, celebrated within the, and I just say the American community, because I know that Africa is on the rising. Um, and what I do love is that you have the opportunity to really um, build and plug um, a lot of a lot of the people who are coming out of the continent. Are there some chefs that you recognize as being, you know, top leaders in the, in, in the culinary industry? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean... So- the, the continent is rising and cooking, you know, has been around forever, but as a profession, it's younger, right? But when I see um, Lagos up in the chefs, like what you also start having now, Linda, is that American chefs before the pandemic just started to come to Cape Town, Lagos to learn and study. Before it was always African chefs going to Europe or African chefs going to um, American to study. Now it just shifted, and that was a very, very important shift. So I hope once we can start traveling again, people start coming down, and there's going to be food festivals in Africa. 
uh, and we're going to be able to get to know each other, and we're going to be able to learn from one another. And I, I, I think the beauty is that African continent is very, the population is very young, and it's it's all about connectivity, right? You have your podcast. Some of you, my friend Michael in Lagos, he has so many different channels of communication. So, and all, all of us has love for Africa, but we also been elsewhere. And this back and forth is very, very important because that's where new ideas married with beautiful traditions, that's where the jam is. That's where the good stuff's going to be. So once we dealt and got a handle of the pandemic, I'm, I feel definitely that Africa's food and black food is rising. Um, you know, the rituals in our continent is a lot much older than anywhere else. So um, I can definitely see in the next 20 years, the most vibrant food in the world will come from Africa. Absolutely. Why not? Absolutely. I'm with you. I'm, I remember being in Ethiopia and we ended up uh, interviewing at the first English radio station. Um, I have to pay homage to Ethiopia um, because that's, that's the second home for me. But um, you know, we interviewed Wolfgang Puck and I was just like, oh my gosh, she's sitting in my studio. But that was that was amazing then. What I'm seeing is a shift on everything that is happening within the continent, you know, where we're just like, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter. Now we're like a degree of separation, no matter what happens. We're literally a degree of separation. Um, what I would love to, um, you know, continue to see is the growth of Africa. And because you brought up Ethiopia, I do want to say or bring up one little topic, and I don't know whether you would be adverse to me speaking about it, but I really loved what you did with um, Anthony Bourdain and, you know, bringing him down and, um, you know, taking him around Ethiopia. I remember he also visited Kenya, but I remember watching, for me, you know, Kenya, Ethiopia, for me, it's merged, it's, it's mm. love. Um, and so what was that like? You know, it was like going back and tracking back into your time and then showing him. And this is part of, you know, where you're saying that we're changing the conversation. You know, we're going to be having food festivals out here soon. Mm -hmm. People are learning from us. So what was that like for you? You know, bringing him into your hometown and you know, um, into the home that you were still, you know, going back yeah. and rediscovering? Well, first of all, it was an amazing trip to uh, go with my wife, Maya, and go back to my family, but also her family to uh, the villages and bring our dear friend Anthony and the hope one to always learn more about Africa and Ethiopia specifically at that journey, but all over Africa. You went to South Africa, went to Kenya, went to so many different places. And, you know, it was homecoming, uh, cooking the traditional food with my sisters. I love that. Uh, cooking, showing Anthony the rituals of Maya's village, you know, how we butcher, how we make it for traditions that's been around for thousands of years, how we ferment and make our own cheese, how we make our butter, how we making Jetta, all of that. And as Tony, as a traveler, as a chef, he was super excited about that. So it was also, we knew obviously this is going to be on CNN. So this week we were showing the world this very personal space, what a small African village can look like. Uh, and, you know, right now today, my heart goes out to you, my country, Ethiopia, because we're going through some really, really difficult times. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard as an Ethiopian today where um, this divisiveness that happens in America also happens in Ethiopia. And it's hard as an African and if the Ethiopian, like, we have to we have to find humanity and we have to find love and kindness and not divisiveness. A lot of this divisiveness that comes from the pulpit of America feeds into the continent and we have to resist that, you know. Same thing, you know, so glad to speak to you today. But, you know, when you think about SARS in, 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 in Lagos and what's happening in Ethiopia today, we have our own African issues that we have to solve as sisters and brothers in Africa. We have to stop hurting one another. We, we, can, we, we cannot blame others. We have to start, stop the distractions and figure out 
the more human side and and build together because once Africa rise, everybody benefits, education, children, environment. And it's just very, very tough as Ethiopian um, for the, over the last couple of days. And I, I don't really want to go into what and how, but it's just a very, very tough moment right now. It is. Um, it's really disheartening. And, you know, to all my Abisha community, you know, we're with you. My Yenefikers, my Yenekunjus, all of you, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I walk this journey with you. Um, as, I, as I continue just to talk about maybe finalizing and getting into our final, you know, parts of this beautiful interview, you know, um, one of the beautiful things that I have um, always thought about is um, because of what you have talked about in, in the sense of the element of, um, inclusiveness in, in in terms of black, um, in terms of black food, black tradition, where it originally started. I see it in the fashion world. I'm sure a lot of people in the fashion world also see it. But um, what is some of you know the takeaways that you have realized during this pandemic and what do you see as um, the opportunities that people need to really jump on and thrive on well i i think it's 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 pretty basic um you have to think about connect spirituality wise whatever your whatever that means it's very personal uh love your family stay safe and all distractions that are non-essential, take them out because you have to focus more than ever and tell your journey, whether you're a painter, whether you're a chef, whether you podcast host, whether what author, speak your truth, tell your journey because it's a very personal, you don't know what's listening on the other side. Like you started this out of, I started this moment out of the pandemic. You started your podcast out of this moment. So there is a silver lining that we need to share you don't know who's out there that is picking up what you're talking about and maybe that's what they need to go on with that day uh or maybe that's what they need to start their own um and i do whatever that might be i do know as as people we're very entrepreneurial uh, we have to figure out things we have to navigate in many ways as as fellow africans we've gone through so many other things so we might have the tools more quick yeah, other places to navigate through this. So whatever level of strength you want to hold on to, hold on to it and make it yours and then share that. But we got to be kinder. We got to be more loving and we got to share our knowledge because um, it's, um, it's going to get rough. It is rough for a lot of people and um, we have to just stay positive. All right. You know what? I know that there's a lot going on. I know you've got plenty of interviews coming up um, and I really want to thank you for your time. You've been back to back to back and I'm so appreciative of it and I'm yeah, truly appreciative. So thank, thank you. you so much. Wishing you guys the best of luck um, through this election. We are yeah. standing with you at the back here and yeah, have a beautiful, wonderful day. May the elections go Biden. Yes, absolutely. Africa, go for Biden. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. Right. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of from Kenya to the America. Like Ugal is one of them. It's called Pop in South Africa. It's called Grit in, in South Carolina. So there's a lot of lineage right there. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you, love. Thank you.